When baby rhinos are orphaned after their mothers are poached, they need immediate, specialized care. Rhino orphanages are safe havens, where the traumatized youngsters are given a second chance at survival, thanks to some extraordinary people. The rhino poaching crisis facing South Africa has some particularly vulnerable casualties. The babies left orphaned after their mothers are killed. If they're lucky, these rhinos are found, rescued, and taken to orphanages. This is the Fundimvilu Tula Tula Rhino Orphanage, and it's one of a number of these closely guarded facilities dotted around South Africa, the country at the center of the rhino poaching crisis. Karen Trendler, a leading international expert on rhino rescue and rehabilitation, has helped set up many of the country's orphanages, including this one. And the first rescued baby rhino to come through these doors was little Ituba. Ituba's mom was poached, and he had quite a, from what we sort of gather from the crime scene and from reports, he had quite a brutal experience of it. He kept trying to get back to the mother. Eventually, he took off after another female who had a young calf of the same age. And it appears from the reports and from what we've seen that she was quite happy to let him hang around and protect him. But when he tried to suckle, she got very aggressive and she actually injured him. So it, he went about eight to nine days in the wild, eating a tiny bit of grass, possibly getting some water. But by the time he was brought in here, he was in really, really appalling condition. When rhino calves like Yituba arrive at the orphanage, it's high-level care all the way. And in the absence of their mothers, it's up to the human team at the orphanage to gain the trust of the animal as soon as possible, so they can administer medical care and get them eating and drinking. Such a good boy, Tibbs. A rhino calf and a mother have an incredibly close bond. It's a one-on-one -on -one bond that lasts for up to three, sometimes four years. A rhino calf will suckle for up to 18 months. With the tiny little calves, we find that they are so desperate to bond that it's quite easy when we bring them into a captive situation to get them to bond to their carers. For Ituba, this person was Axel Teresa. Within 24 hours, he learned to trust him. And although it took a while for his health to improve, his recovery began. Yeah, Ituba arrived in April last year. He was very, very traumatized. And yeah, it was very hard for him. He showed the PTSD sign very quickly the first night. He was just trying to climb on this wall, you see. All this, this is all his horn trying to get out, calling his mom for hours. And it was very, very hard. The bond between the two is strong, but it's not one that can last forever. For Ituba to have a chance of returning to the wild, he will have to be weaned slowly, not only off milk, but human contact too. Hard-earned experience over the years has shown us that when calves are raised with too much contact with humans, where they're just getting used to every human, lots of volunteers, they become potentially quite problematic and quite dangerous. If we bond that calf to just two or three keepers maximum and keep other people away, that when you withdraw that contact, that calf goes wild. It then isn't so tame that it'll walk up to any human, which is going to make it not only a potentially problem animal, but much more vulnerable to poaching. Raising wild animals that will be suitable for eventual release takes more than just ensuring the animals are fed and healthy. If you think of a little rhino in the wild, he has a huge amount of stimulation going on all the time. There are other animals around, there's mom to run into, there's mom to play with, there's new smells, there's wind, there's always something going on. And then you have a calf in a Burma situation. It's pretty boring. So part of our challenge is also to find things that stimulate, that keep that rhino occupied. And people are always absolutely amazed at how much these calves play and how puppy-like they are. If you think in a human baby, play is a critical part of learning life skills, of developing, of growing, and it's just the same with little rhino. So their play, although it looks like it's great fun, invariably is related to things that they're going to have to do later in their life. The process of rehabilitating a baby rhino is a gradual one that lasts about three years. 
Only then will baby rhinos be ready to return to the wild. That's three years of intensive rehabilitation, with vast amounts of money and resources dedicated to just a few individual animals. Well, for us, the humane side, we don't have to justify that. That's a given. But if you look at it really from a completely hard economic point of view, if that calf is reared properly in the right facilities, in the right way, and is then able to go back into and contribute to the conservation, the financial input of rearing that calf, as opposed to the financial value of that rhino, ultimately far outweighs it. So it's worth that investment if you're looking at just resources and money. And if you look at it from a conservation perspective, as the numbers in the population drop, every single individual within that population becomes increasingly important. Since Ituba's arrival, a number of other calves, all with tragic stories, have arrived at the orphanage. Looking after these baby rhinos who have experienced such great trauma in their lives can also take its toll on the people working with them. But what many people don't realize is the people who are involved in the front lines, the anti-poaching staff, the vets who are doing the post-mortems, the people who are doing the investigations, and response staff like ourselves and people who are actually working with the traumatized calves and the injured rhinos are going through incredible levels of trauma and stress as well. And we're seeing increasing compassion fatigue, increasing burnout or heading towards burnout in people who are working in the field. But you have times where you actually think, uh, I can't do another day of this. I actually, you know, what am I doing? The, the easier ways of living. And then your conscience just kicks in. And, you know, as the human involved, you're having a much, much easier time than the rhino involved. And you can't walk away. The long-term effects of the poaching crisis on the rhino population as a whole are also not known. It's not only rhinos that have been directly involved in a poaching situation that are affected. The anti-poaching presence, constantly checking them, the monitoring, that in itself, although necessary, has an impact on them. The dynamics are changing, and we don't know long term what that is going to do to the rhino populations. Stress and reproduction uh, are directly linked. The higher the stress, the more impact you have on reproduction. So even if we stop poaching tomorrow, we have a population that is stressed, and our accumulation rate, or the way in which that population recovers, may well be impacted. With just under 1,020 rhinos killed in 2015, it doesn't seem like the crisis will be over anytime soon. It's a devastating and disheartening statistic. There has to be hope. We can't give up. And so often sponsors, donors, people who are involved say, you know, in spite of everything that's being done, in spite of it, we're still losing rhino. But just think how much closer we would be to losing rhino if people weren't doing this.